Hey, everybody, and welcome to Basic Statistical Concepts. So this is week three of our Analytics 500 or Intro to Statistics course. And we are going to start learning stats tonight. So let's get started. Now, a quick review from last week's notes. Thinking about how we analyze data and interpret those results, we're going to start to build models. And you have to think very broadly about models. They can't just be like, like I think when people say models, they think these like huge complex systems and it doesn't have to be. It can simply be a model where the mean is the model. And so in this lecture, what we're going to cover is um, frequency distributions or measures of shape, central tendencies or measures of distance, dispersions or measures of spread, and then and on some alternative options like a z-score, which is a bit of a measure of, of a distance and association, which is correlation. Now we have a whole separate week on correlation, but you can get the basic idea of like why this is a good descriptive statistic as well as a statistical test. All right, so that's our outline. Let's jump right in. So a frequency distribution is usually considered a graph, although we can also make a frequency table that plots our values along the bottom. Now these values could be categorical, they could be Likert, Likert, they could be interval, but generally frequency distributions are held for uh, continuous data uh, is more common to use them and a frequency table more common for categorical data. Although you can make what's called a Pareto chart which is a frequency distribution for uh, categorical data that puts them in like highest to lowest format. And so that's on the X axis. And then it has bars showing the frequency or how many times as the Y axis. So these are really good to just get a view of the distribution of the data. And these are measures of shape. Sometimes they're just called histograms instead of a frequency distribution, but those mean the same thing. So here's a cute little example of the normal distribution. But understanding any distribution of data can, is pretty critical. And we'll get into this more when we do data screening and data, data assumptions, because many of the analyses we're going to do have the assumption of normality, for example. And so we want to know what the data looks like. Now, the assumption of normality is not actually on the data, small point there. But understanding what the data looks like will help us understand outliers, so uh, uh, data points that are way outside the normal range, um, and then just skew, which we're about to get to. So it just, it's always good to make a nice plot of your, of your data. Okay. And so we're mostly going to focus on this normal distribution. And <laughs> it's normal in quotes, because most real data doesn't really fall, isn't normal. Right. So we talked about teaching evaluations in one of our last lectures, and those are definitely not normal. Okay. They tend to skew towards the high end, it's really great, or towards the low end, it's really bad. And so, but to describe what we mean by skew, we have to have some base comparison point. So that comparison point tends to be the normal distribution. Now there are a lot of other distributions. So there's gamma and there's beta, and there's binomial and there's F and there's chi-square and I could keep going. So there's so many, <laughs> but, and they're all um, interrelated to each other um, because they can be transformed from one to another often. Um, but let's use the normal distribution as our like comparison for understanding what data looks like. So the normal distribution itself is bell-shaped, okay, meaning that it's even on each side. You can fold it in half, hot dog style, <laughs> and the two tops would line up. Okay. And so that means that it's symmetric around the center. Now, the nice thing about these distributions, when they fall into sort of a known category, we know the proportion of the amount of data that should fall into each section. So the normal distribution here has this kind of like tall middle point. Um, and we know that approximately 64%, I had to think about my table there for a second, of the data should fall within very close to the mean or the middle here. Okay. And so 
the nice thing about these known distributions is that we can use them to calculate probabilities, which is a section that we'll get to in the next week's lecture. And so this is what a, what a normal distribution looks like. Um, now I would say that, you know, this is like the perfect normal distribution. Real data doesn't necessarily fall this way, but there are things that we can do to kind of um, assume that the data is close enough. Right? Now a frequency table is also useful. And I would say frequency tables are usually a little bit better for categorical data. So things that have labels, like we talked about in the last class, um, binary, nominal, or maybe even ordinal data. Whereas the, the graph, the histogram is usually a little bit better for uh, continuous level data. But it's really easy to make a frequency table. So let's look at this data set. We're gonna use this Quakes data set uh, a few times here. So I loaded the data sets library. Don't forget, you have to turn them on when you get started. I say, you know what, give me that Quakes data and let's just see what's in it. Okay, so the Quakes data set has latitude and longitude of where the earthquake happened, the depth, and then the magnitude of the earthquake. Okay. Station here is just which station recorded it. Okay. So while station is an integer here, it's really almost a categorical variable in the sense that this is more of a, um, a label than it is an actual integer. Right? So let's look at the table function. So here we have table right? and we wanna just calculate a table of the um, frequencies, the magnitudes of the frequencies. So, wait, I said that backwards. The frequencies of the magnitudes. <laughs> so uh, the table function is really handy for that. And we'll use the table function a lot when we're kind of testing if data um, is what we think it is. So uh, one issue that you might have with scales is they might be reverse cord coded. Let's have another, let's have another sip of my coffee here. Reverse coded. Okay. And reverse coded scale is one where you, you answer it one to five, but because of the way it's worded, we flip that score so that it matches the rest of the scale. And one thing I like to do when I'm working with these is just create a frequency table using the table function here of the like one to five, do my reverse coding, and then just make sure that that table is then just flipped over. So they're really handy for more than um, for like just checking, making sure you're doing stuff right when you're practicing coding. So what do you put in the table function? Well, the main argument is some vector of data. Okay, don't do table on an entire data frame. It actually, I think, will warn you that this is a very bad idea. Okay, so tables can be on one vector or several vectors, and it'll create what's called a conditional frequency table based on if you have two of them, right? It'll base uh, you know, all the values of one by all the values of the other. Makes you a really big chart. Okay. So if I wanted to look at gender and handedness, for example, I could have uh, identify as male and female and then left and right hand. And so I get a little two by two table of the frequencies. So that's conditional because there's more than one variable. Okay. So you just be careful doing those because if you tell it to make a, a table, I have totally done this and crashed R. Uh, on the entire data frame, it tries to do every variable conditionalized on the other ones. And if you have 400 columns, it gets really mad and then you have to crash our studio and start over. <laughs> so don't do that. Generally, what we're just going to do is put in a vector here. Now, what do we get out of this? Well, what we get out of it here is the first or the top row. Now, this goes on to two rows for me, but the top row here are the actual values in the data. Okay, so we've got uh, earthquake magnitude starting at four here, going up through 6.4. Now, those are the actual data values in the data. The second number, the bottom number here, is the frequency of those values. So that's why a table can be really tedious for continuous data, because if you have data with lots of decimals, it just gets a really long table. It's really great for data that is one thing or this or that, right? So for factors. Because then the table's small. But here we're sort of somewhere in the middle. So we have 46 earthquakes that were a four, 
um, 55 earthquakes that were 4.1 and up. Now I can kind of look at this data and see that there are some bigger numbers here towards the bottom of the scale. So maybe it's not normal because we might expect the biggest numbers to be in the middle of the scale. But you know, this can be much easier with a picture. So let's look at that plot. Okay. There are lots of ways to make a histogram in R, but the simplest way is using the base R function hist for histogram. Histogram can take a couple arguments, but here's the main two. So the first argument is the vector of data that you want to put in. So we put in our quakes column, our magnitude column. And then this breaks function is just allows you to change the, the how big those bars are. Okay. So I'm gonna flip back over to, to R here to show you the difference of what happens. So let's go down here to histogram. I tell everything above that to run. So make sure I have my data set open and then run this breaks function. Okay. So let's see if we happen we make this one. Okay. What do you think is gonna happen? Well, it's tempting to think of breaks as how wide the window is. Okay. That's not quite how it works, right? So if I have a scale that's four, five and six effectively, and you make a break one, you think it might give me everything from four to five and everything from five to six. Well, that's not quite what it did. Okay, well, let's make it five, see what happens. Okay, uh, let's make it point two. So I, I have never been very, it's like, you know, no, don't do that, <laughs> not allowed. If you have bigger data, you, you actually can, but let's make it a hundred, see what happens. So with breaks, I it always is like smaller numbers are wider windows, and then um, bigger numbers are smaller windows. So you just gotta find kind of the right point. Okay, there's probably some magic magic to knowing what the breaks points are, but I'm just always kind of like play with it till it looks about right. Okay, and what do you mean by looks about right? Well, you obviously don't want the bars to be really wide because that is misleading in the data. So this looks kind of like a stair step. If I calculate breaks at about 20, I can see there's actually this dip in the data. And so you're just trying your best not to misrepresent the data. Okay. Let's see what it actually says that that breaks function does. Maybe then I'll understand it. So let's use the help, right? It's a question mark, hist. All right, so breaks can be a vector giving the break points. Okay, so I could say break at four, five, six. It could be a function. It could be a number given the number of cells for the histogram. So I guess this is making 20 different. Oh, oh, epiphany. <laughs> so the number here, wow, I'm learning all the things this week, um, is how many bars it's making. That makes a lot more sense. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Who knew? Um, so that's why you get one here for one. So it's not the width of the window, it's how many bars you are. I have to like call a phone a friend here in a minute. Okay, so 20, so about 20 bars looks right for this. Okay. Um, or a function to compute the number of cells. So here's why looking at the help is useful. Okay, so remember how to get there, question mark, name of the function. If I can type. So I, again, I've always said that 15 magically is a really good number. It always seems to work really well for me. And that's probably because data representation wise and the size that we're working with, somewhere between 15 to 20 bars kind of makes sense. Okay. Now on a one to seven scale, that number of bars makes no sense, right? So we should probably think about seven, one for each point. Since we have a four to six scale in increments of 0.1, so let's see, we've got 6.4 minus four, so 2.4 points divided by boop, 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 0.1 increments. So maybe 24 is the magic spot, possible numbers. And I didn't really change that much, okay? Because it's the number of possible points that could happen. Now, if we have a crazy number of decimals, we wouldn't want to do that. So just kind of play with it.
Yeah, I'll leave it at 24. I might put in what breaks means here in the notes too. Right. Now, what can I say about this graph? Well, it's not that exciting really, right? So let's talk a little bit about how we describe these graphs. So the properties of a frequency distribution, especially when we're comparing them to normal, include two kind of main descriptors. So the first one is skew, and I've already kind of used that word, and this is the symmetry of the distribution. So we've talked about how the normal distribution, hot dog fold, fold it in half, it's the same on each side. If we cause that distribution to lean, right, it no longer folds correctly. I'm like trying to do this with my hands here, right? It no longer folds correctly. So skew is how much it leans away from normal. This is a really easy political joke as well. Right? So skews how much it leans to the left or how much it leans to the right. Okay. Positive skew is where the scores are, are bunched at the low end and the tail points to the positive end. Negative skew is where the scores are bunched to the high end and the tail points to the low end. And that always confuses the heck out of people. And what I would say is that what you need to know is that skew is where the data isn't. Okay. It's where the tail of the data is. And what do I mean by tail? Let's back up here. Here. So there, the tail of the data. So to make this a perfect hot dog fold, we're missing all this data here on the right. Okay. So this is a positive skew, even though it leans to the left. Okay. The other thing I've seen people do is draw like cat ears on these. Let's see if we can quick find a good Google. Don't let me down, Google. Oh, I'm gonna get like pictures of cats, which is okay, I guess. <laughs> eh? I don't remember what textbook I saw this in where someone had drawn like a cat on the distribution. Okay. I can't draw, you don't wanna watch me do it. But basically the idea here is that you put the cat head here and the tail of the distribution is where the skew is. So you can remember that this is a little kitty cat and that tail over here indicates this is positive skew because the tail's on the positive, the higher side. Okay. Now positive doesn't mean that the numbers physically are positive because we don't have any negative numbers here, right? It runs four to six. It just means that it's on the upper end of the graph. Okay. Negative skew is the other way where the low values, even if they're not actually negative, are where the data is missing, so to speak, okay, where the tail is. The other option, so we talked about lean, right, is sort of spread. So kurtosis, kurtosis is about the heaviness of the tails, but that is determined by the spread of the data. So distribution that has been um, flattened out Right, so you took a normal distribution and you went squish and it's flattened out. We'll have what are called light tails. It's a platycartic distribution, the second one here. A distribution that you've taken and go whoop, squished in, will have heavier tails. It's called a leptocartic distribution. And there's a very famous picture for these leptocartic. Very famous picture that I'm just gonna have to search the word here. Kangaroo. Oh man, where's my platypus picture? Ah, here it is. Okay. So can I make it bigger? Can I go to whatever this is? Ah, so this is the, like super famous picture of a platycartic distribution, which is a platypus, right? Because it's flattened out from normal and a leptocartic distribution, which is kangaroos because they're fighting each other and they have long skinny tails. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so that's kurtosis. So that can, technically the definition of kurtosis is based on the tails, but if you can remember platypus flat, leptocartic, kangaroo skinny, you'll be fine. All right, so here's another picture of skew. So this one here would be a positive skew. So we've got a little cat head, the tail's on the positive side. This one here would be negative skew because our tail's on the negative or the lower side of the, the graph. 
Uh, here's an example of ketosis, right? So this is a leptokirtic distribution here, a skinny distribution, and a platykirtic distribution here, a flatter distribution. Okay. Leptokirtic distributions are positive, okay, because they're skinnier than normal, and um, platykirtic distributions are negative when it comes to the numbers we're going to look at. So. Now that we know these terms, what shape does our histogram have? And I didn't put any breaks in this one. So it will auto pick a number of breaks for you. And that's approximately the same kind of picture we've been looking at. Even though we figured out that like 20, 24 breaks is the best. Anywho, so it's definitely not normal. This is a skewed distribution, you know, towards the bottom. So it's positive skew because here's the tail. And I'm not sure what I would think kurtosis wise because okay, the skew is so, so strong. Well, it's not huge, but the skew is there, right? Maybe it's a little flattened from normal. Okay, because it's a little more uniform. Okay, uniform meaning they have the same scores all the way across. So maybe I would suggest that it's a little bit platykirtic. Okay, flatter than normal. Let's see. So there's a really cool package called Moments. Now the moments package has two cool functions, skewness and kurtosis. Okay, it's not skew, it's skewness. And so you just put in the column that you're interested in. And so it tells us that the skew is positive. Eh? So it's 0.76. We'll talk about how to interpret that in a second. Another cool package that you can look at is psych. We'll use the psych package a lot. It does a bunch of cool stuff. And it gives you a bunch of statistics all at once. And so I'll show this one over and over again, but it also tells us skew and kurtosis all at the same time. So I might bias you towards psych because it gives you so much stuff. Um, even standard error, which we talked, um, which we have not talked about, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> which we're gonna talk about, which is a harder statistic to get out of a summary, summary function. This is what happens when you spend, that, spend the time making the notes. We have not talked about standard error just yet, uh, but it gives me skew and kurtosis at the same time. Now, what did we say? We said that leptokartic distributions were positive. So I went through, I got it wrong. Okay. This is why the numbers are useful. Okay. So skew is positive and so is kurtosis. Now you have to wait because there's a special interpretation for kurtosis. Okay. So interpreting skewness here, how can we interpret this number? Well, there are ways to convert this number into um, a standardized value. But generally, there are some rules of thumb here. And all semester, we're going to talk about rules of thumb. There will be rules of thumb for nearly everything. But you have to remember that every rule of thumb is, is just that. <laughs> it's just a, just a suggestion. Um, they're not hard and fast rules. There are ways that we can kind of help us like center our thinking. Okay. So if skewness is less than negative 1 or greater than 1, Okay, so past one, the distribution is likely fairly skewed. Ours is 0.77, so okay. If the skewness is between the absolute value of 0.5 and 1, it's moderately skewed. I'd say that's a good representation of the R graph. And if the skewness is between basically 0.5 and 0, then it's pr approximately symmetric. Okay, it may not be normal, but it's symmetric, so we can fold it in half. It may be symmetric and flat. So we can't say something is normal unless it's both um, symmetric and not kurtotic kurt is the word. So ours falls in this moderately skewed category. Now with kurtosis, there's a function called kurtosis. Okay. Now I'm not sure, I think in the moments library, it's not giving us the same type of kurtosis here. Obviously, these are, are pretty different. I think this one is giving us um, what's going to be called uh, the excess kurtosis in psych. And this one is giving us the literal kurtosis, which we'll get to in just a second. But let's see if we can figure that out. So we're going to Google, not Google. <laughs> we're going to, I am, it is not even late. <laughs> like more coffee here. All right, so psych library, let's look at describe, okay, which is a function in psych here. <clears throat> um, I wanted describe, thank you. 
Perfect. Okay. Now, the great thing about the psych package is that it gives us just a whole bunch, I'm gonna move my face up here real quick, of definitions of what it's calculating. So we're gonna scroll, scroll, scroll. Type one, find skinny synchrotosis. Values, skew kurtosis. So I'm not gonna be able to find it quickly. My best guess is that it's giving us the kurtosis um, as the excess kurtosis. Okay, and I will kind of comb through that and make sure that's correct. And how can I figure that out? Well, here in moments, what we see is it gives us a 3.5. In psych here, it gives us 0.5. Now that seems pretty different until I show you this slide, where kurtosis actually in a normal distribution is three. Okay. So uh, the default number instead of being zero is three. But to help with aid with interpretation, it's uh, often, what people often do is they subtract three from all the numbers. And so if we take our kurtosis value from moments, we 3.5, and we subtract three, we end up with one in psych, which is 0.5. So I think psych is giving you what's called excess kurtosis. So how much more kurtotic is it from normal? Okay. And so interpreting the excess kurtosis number can be done with, okay. so a normal distribution has a kurtosis of exactly three, so where the excess is zero. Okay. So if your kurtosis excess is zero from psych, right, it's normal. Okay. It does, it's not fat or skinny. It might skew. <laughs> now it's kind of hard to have distributions that are skewed, not also have kurtosis. Okay. So you can, you know, you can probably have a, um, a non-skewed distribution that has a lot of kurtosis, but it's hard when you skew things to keep it from getting skinnier fat. Okay. Now, any distribution with, um, with a kurtosis at exactly three, so the excess is zero, that's called mesokurtic, okay. which just is a fancy word for normal. <laughs> Doesn't have kurtosis. Okay, so mesokurtic is normal. Distributions with less than three, so this would be negative kurtosis, okay. excess kurtosis are platykurtic. And that means that the tails are shorter and thinner, the central peak is lower, this is squished. Okay. Distributions with an excess kurtosis that's positive, so greater than three, are leptokurtic. These are our skinny kangaroo ones. And so the tails are longer and fatter, and this is often called uh, where the distribution is skinny. Okay. Now I'm never gonna like pop quiz, what's leptokurtic, right? You'll be able to look these up because it's easy to get them backwards. Uh, but you should be able to take a picture and look, calculate these numbers and use these rules to help yourself understand your distribution. Okay, so what we have is a moderately skewed distribution that has excess kurtosis that's positive Okay, so it's leptokurtic. And I mean, I've looked at these distributions for a long time and I that graph I couldn't tell and I got it wrong. So be sure to use the numbers in tandem with the graph. And we'll talk a whole lot more about these and why, should you care? Should we be worried about that kind of stuff when we get to the data screening section? All right, so let me see, where was I gonna stop? Okay, a couple more slides and then we'll break for this one and I'll have two videos. So we're gonna switch here from frequency distributions to central tendency. Okay. So we went from uh, pictures, right? Essentially to measures of, of distance. Okay. Now central tendency is kind of the fancy name for where's the middle. Okay. And it's a single value that attempts to describe the data by identifying the middle. Okay. Now the middle can be defined in several ways. You wouldn't think this, right? It's just the middle. Okay. And, but what we can do is um, based on the type of distribution, define the middle a couple of ways. Okay. And so measures of central tendency are sometimes called central location, right? You just gotta remember that central tendency means the middle. 
And so we can use the fantastic summary function to get a few of these. We can get two of them. Um, where is the median and the mean? So the median skew is uh, 4.6. I'm sorry, the median magnitude of the earthquakes is 4.6, and the average is 4.62. Pretty close. And then there are a couple of other packages here that I want to highlight um, before we take a break in the paste CS package. Okay, now paste CS actually paste this in, um, in scientific notation, which we can turn off. Um, but the main thing that you want to be interested in here is it has the median and the mean, but it actually will allow you to calculate um, on the whole, we calculated it on the whole data set. Okay. You can actually do that with the summary function too where we calculate on the whole data set. But also notice here, it has got some other stuff that we were gonna talk about. I said we were gonna talk about later. HMISC also has a few different ones. Now I do love the output. They tried to make these kind of cutesy tables and that's great. But in the format here from PasteDS, this is gonna be easier for us to work with. Right, so when it prints out Q, it's hard sometimes to get the numbers into something, a different formula or function or to print them out. When it prints out in a table, it's easy to continue to manipulate and work with. Okay. But you can pick your favorite one. Um, so let's see, where were we looking here? We've got the mean, okay. and then the 0.5 here would be the median. Okay. So let's look at the magnitudes to make sure that matches mean. Yes, and then 0.5 here is the median. And we'll talk about why is it 0.5 in the next lecture. All right, one last one, and back to psych. So psych's describe function will actually take the entire data frame and describe it for you. It's really great if it's a character value. It just basically just says like, I, I can't do this. Don't ask me to. Um, but it will give you a couple of different options. So here's the mean, and then here's the median, okay. and the, along with our skew and kurtosis. Right. So let's pause there and take a quick break. And then we'll come back and talk about like what, what, what are the mean and the median. <laughs> so we've talked about how to get those measures of central tendency. And then we'll start talking about like exactly what they are and finish out with some other options for describing our distributions.